Here's a sight you haven't seen in a while. In fact, it's been a year and eight months since the last time we held a full field Prodigy Bowlers Tour event. But this one is extra special, one for the ages. Because as Coach Randy was about to move from the Atlanta area to Kansas City, this was our last chance to get the band back together again and hold one more Prodigy Bowlers Tour event in the Atlanta area. One more for the road. It's the Farewell Atlanta send-off edition of Prodigy Bowlers Tour, and it starts right now. Celebrating Junior Bowling, elevating Junior Bowlers. This is Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Live on tape for the final time at Bolero Roswell in Roswell, Georgia. This is Coach Randy, welcoming you to episode 127 of Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Farewell, Atlanta. Just to be perfectly clear, this is not, I hope, the final episode of Prodigy Bowlers Tour. It's just the last one that will originate from the Atlanta metro area. We taped this episode on October 24th, 2021, and on November 15th, with all my belongings packed in a U-Haul truck, my dog Oreo and I headed west for Kansas City, the town where I grew up. Home of the greatest barbecue in the world, and where I will never again have to endure my beloved Kansas City Chiefs being preempted on local television by the Falcons. Or even worse, the Jaguars or Titans. Since November 16th, I've been in the greater Kansas City area, and in the coming months, I hope to find a suitable home for Prodigy so that we can launch Prodigy 2.0 from the Kansas City metro area. So keep your fingers crossed and stay tuned for that. But before we got away from the Peach State, I wanted to get as many kids back together for one final Prodigy blowout as we could. The event was open to all junior bowlers who had ever bowled in a Prodigy event even if they'd since aged out of youth bowling. And of course, any current youth bowlers who had never bowled Prodigy were welcome to participate as well. We had some unfinished business to deal with. For starters, when the pandemic forced us all to scatter to the wind, we were in the middle of the 2019-2020 season, and the red coveted trophy pin was left orphaned by the unexpected suspension of play. So today, we're going to award that pin to our winner. Plus, as many Prodigy viewers may recall, when the show was forced into hiatus due to the pandemic, I launched a short-lived series called Pandemic Bowlers Tour, where I bowled on a carpeted lane in my living room, drawing names of Prodigy viewers from a drum and bowling for them with the viewer who won each week, getting his or her name put on a giant pin I called the COVID-Ed Trophy Pin. Today, as each of our kids come up to bowl for the first time, they will draw a name from the drum of entries from viewers of the Pandemic Bowlers Tour series. And when we crown a winner of the red orphaned coveted trophy pin today, his or her home viewer will also win the COVID-Ed Trophy Pin. Plus, we'll crown a third winner today. Our competition today will be Scratch, and since we have a mix of bigs and littles, another giant pin like the one designated as the COVID-Ed Trophy Pin will be awarded to the little who finishes highest in the competition. I asked all the kids bowling today to sign it, so whichever little has the highest finish today will get a nice keepsake to remember the day. The format of today's competition was pretty straightforward. Two qualifying games. The top four qualifiers secured guaranteed spots in our stepladder finals. And the fifth spot will go to the survivor of our single ball elimination wildcard round. The order we'll bowl the single ball eliminator will be decided by the order they finished the qualifier, with the lowest finisher going first. We're bowling on the house shot today, so I expect these kids to light it up. So, without further ado, we begin the single ball eliminator. And we begin with Aubrey Nathanson. Reach in there and pull one out. There you go. 
And let's see who it is. Charlie Sipper. Okay, just one. Just just read their name. Charlie. Simper Man. There you go. Simper Man. It's Charlie Simper Man of Sammamish, Washington. That means if Aubrey Nathanson wins the red coveted trophy pin today, Charlie Simperman wins the COVID Ed trophy pin. There's a nine count for Aubrey. That's usually enough to go on. Next up, Rowan Sautner. There you go. Yeah, just keep it open. Colton Deeren of Cottondale, Alabama. All right, Colton. Rowan Sautner will be bowling for you today in the race for the COVID Ed trophy pin. Haven't seen Rowan at the bowling alley in a while, but it looks like he's been practicing. Next up, Ty Carter, a newbie in the Roswell Varsity League. All right, draw one, Ty. Who are you bowling for? Ty. Andrew Mills of Lafayette, Louisiana. This is Ty's first appearance on Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Bowling for Andrew Mills. And Ty stuffs him straight back. A strike, he's safe on to frame two. Next up, Christian Minnell. Who are you bowling for? Who could it be? Who are you bowling for? Andrew Crook. Andrew Crook? of Yakima, Washington. He is a big fan of the show. I know who he is. Andrew will be rooting hard for Christian Minnell, who will be representing him in the chase for the COVID Ed trophy pin that you see at the bottom of the screen. Oops, that's a six count, and that could be trouble. We'll find out. Next up is Alana Harding. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Alana Harding next to go. And you are bowling for Jack Roy of Du Bois, Pennsylvania. Alana made one other appearance on Prodigy Bowlers Tour a couple of years ago on one of our Halloween episodes. She threw one ball in the single ball eliminator and that was it. She'd like to do a little better this time. She's at least made it on to frame two with a nose dive strike. Next up is Drake Meenick. Who's the lucky contestant? Jonathan Mosbach. Jonathan Mosbach. Oh, Mosbach. Of Bethlehem, right. Pennsylvania. Well, I don't really know if we're butchering these names or not. If we are, apologies to Jonathan Mosbach of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Drake Meenick has got your back. He's bowling for you in the race for the COVID Ed trophy pin, which you see at the very foreground at the bottom of the screen. Needs to beat six. And nine will do it. So Drake is safely on to frame two. Next up, Lane Cepeda, a newcomer. All right, that would be Kirk Hegel of Duluth, Minnesota. Lane bowled in our homeschool league during the week, and then I didn't see him for a number of years, and then 
I spotted him one Saturday recently bowling in the Roswell Varsity, which is a somewhat scaled-down league now, but he was looking pretty good out there. Ooh! Leaves the super washout. That takes Christian off the hook. Next up, Josh Greenberg. Who are you bowling for? Daniel Williamson. All right, it's Daniel Williamson of Anderson, South Carolina. All right. As we wait for the pin setter to clear, we have a 180 stop for the moment. Anybody who bowls in a center with Brunswick A2 pin setters is familiar with that look. But Josh, you've got a full rack now. Oh, wait a minute. Got to go get his bowling ball. You can't bowl without that. So we see on the score sheet Lane Cepeda with that five count. Let Christian back in it. See what Josh can do here. Now that strike will get him on to the second frame. No problem. Jorge Seda next up. Gentlemen, it's Jorge. We haven't seen Jorge on Prodigy in a long time. Rachel Marlowe. Rachel Marlowe. Rachel lives in Spotsylvania, Virginia. Rachel, one of the players who actually bought a lane similar to the one that I was using on the Stay at Home House Shot series. And Jorge gets her a strike. And they're both on to the next frame. All right, Christopher Nathanson. All right. Who's the lucky contestant that gets Christopher? Corey McKenzie. All right. It's Corey McKenzie of Cresap Town, Maryland. This young man just shot 299 recently. Well, that one gets away from him, but seven is still going to be good enough. So he's safe for now. Jesse Hamadi. The player who wins the competition for best dress today. Anthony Tommaso. All right. Anthony Tommaso of Nanticoke, Pennsylvania. I'm probably butchering these names. Sorry. You say Tommaso, I say Tommaso. Either way, Anthony, you got Jesse Hamadi bowling for you today. Clad in his Patrick Mahomes jersey. Very similar to the one I'm wearing. And that eight count is good enough to get on to frame two. As now it's bowling Nolan Kemp. It is... Jamie Archibald of Norwich, Connecticut. Jamie, you got Bolin Nolan bowling for you. Now these players will continue bowling for the home viewer whose name they've drawn as long as they stay in the competition today. And that nine count gets Nolan on to frame two. As we clear the decks for Marquise Burrell. My, how you've grown since we saw you last. It is Nicholas Solar of Baudette, Minnesota. Not only has this young fellow grown, but his game has grown too. You saw him climb the stepladder in our league TOC a few years ago, finishing second. He has since gone to a two-handed style. And he gets it to work to perfection that time for a strike. 
Next up, John Schlitch. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. Connor. That is Connor King of Altoona, Pennsylvania. John won our Roswell Varsity Tournament of Champions and a sweet little $900 scholarship in his smart account. Gets a crossover to go. That's a strike. And John is safely on to frame two. Next up, Faith Roper. All right, Brady Fries. It just says Massachusetts. Apparently, we couldn't make out what he wrote for a town, but we'll figure it out. Will you have fries with that? Yes, you will. Brady Fries. Tagging along here with Faith Roper. Good to see these kids again. Faith, another one that's gone to two-handed. Uh, that one doesn't quite get up, but six is just enough to get past frame one. Next up, Noah Hogard. All right, Noah. Pick a good one. I got Trey. I'm not even gonna pronounce that last name. Good God. Oh, yeah, okay. Trey Hendrich Meyer of Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Well, Noah's got his home viewer selected. Now, again, the way this works is if Noah, for example, were to go on to win today, claim the red orphaned coveted trophy pin, then Trey Hendrich Meyer would claim the COVID-ed trophy pin. Seven. That's enough. And we've got one more player in the field today. Ashley Adams, another first-timer on Prodigy. Okay, Ashley, draw a name. Who are you going to be bowling for? Daniel Dayan? Okay, it's... Daniel Dayan of Selangor in Malaysia. Wow, all the way from Malaysia. Prodigy Daniel Dayan, Diane, not sure. Ashley, who bowls out at Southern Lanes in the southern suburbs of Atlanta. Labels the pocket for a strike. And so she is safely on to frame two. And it looks like that five count by Lane Cepeda gonna spell the end to his day as they try to strike up a chorus of na 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 na, hey hey, kiss him goodbye and we had no takers so we'll just say goodbye to lane and move to frame two everybody will move over to the right lane lane 40 and we're back to the top of the order again low pinfall is eliminated so you don't have to have the best score you just have to avoid having the worst score and once again aubrey who finished in the 21st position out of our 21 person field. Clips off three. That's not good. That's not what she wanted. But you never know, we've had some strange things happen on these single ball eliminators. Rowan Sautner will be next to go. We won't go back through and recap the home viewer's name for each one of these players. You'll just have to remember, if they drew your name, you're still up. That's 
another strike for Rowan Sautner. It's like he's ready to go for a big tournament. All right, now this young man is very interesting. He and his family just moved here from Killeen, Texas. And he is just getting acclimated to Georgia and the youth league here at Bolero Roswell. He is a member of the Roswell Varsity. 12 years old. Been bowling since he was about five, what I understand. Got a pretty solid game. I think the sky's the limit for this kid. That's two in a row. He just pasted the pocket. So he's safely on to frame three. Next up is Christian Minnell, who, well, he got a haircut for the show today. I told him, just let it grow, man. He looked like a hippie for a while. I liked it. He bowled a 300 recently. Except his came in league, and now he's got the ring to show for it. Scatters him with a light hit. Hit him thin and watch him spin is what they always said. All right, Alana Harding. She has become quite a prolific tournament bowler. Bowling all the GYBTs in the area, the Georgia Youth Bowlers Tour. And has traveled to some other tournaments. Well, that one didn't come off her hand quite like she wanted. Accurate, but left the 5-7. Doesn't matter. Eight is enough in this instance. So, Drake Meenick clears the pin deck. And gets set to throw. Drake won in the Littles division on Prodigy Bowlers Tour in that final season that we unfortunately had to suspend play when the pandemic forced us all to scatter to the wind. And as you can see, he's gotten a lot better with that two-handed style of his pocket 710 would not be uh, met with a smile under most circumstances but in this particular case it's enough and so as you see on the score sheet we skip lane who was eliminated in the first frame and josh greenberg will be next to go It's interesting to see how some of these kids have grown. Josh rips the rack with that one. He's grown just enough that he looks like he's now throwing the ball instead of the ball throwing him. He needed to grow a little bit. And now Jorge Seda, who has gotten quite a bit taller then I remember him from a little over a year and a half ago. That's another Brooklyn that misses the head pin left, but good enough for six, and that'll do. So next up in the order, Christopher Nathanson. First time I laid eyes on Christopher and his sister Aubrey, their dad brought him over and they just watched Prodigy one day. And the next time they came back, 
they participated and Christopher partnered with Jesse Hamadi and took the title. This little left-hander has grown and he too has gotten stronger. That ball hooks a little high and he probably wouldn't like that split if he was bowling with his own score, but in a single ball eliminator, that's good enough when all you need to do is beat three. Speaking of Jesse Hamadi, the last time we saw Jesse on Prodigy was our last full-length episode before the show went on hiatus, the 2020 George Washington Open, and this guy set the Prodigy scoring record. And he gets nine this time, and that'll be good enough to move on. Well, Nolan Kemp practically grew up in our youth program here at Bolero Roswell. Started when he was quite young. And unfortunately, we didn't get to give him a proper send-off because he aged out during that period when we were on hiatus. Ooh, five. Well, it's enough this time. All you got to do is beat three to continue. Next up, Marquise Burrell. I first saw Marquise when he was just a little guy, and his dad was living in the same apartment complex I was. And... He wasn't big enough to... He could just about hide behind a bowling ball. Oh, no! Well, now. Aubrey, put your shoes back on, girl. You're not done yet. Marquise just gave you a reprieve. All right, next up, John Schlitsch. One thing I noticed when he was up last is he's gone to a three-step approach, something you don't see very often nowadays. I can only think of maybe one pro bowler of any real significance who bowled with a three-step approach, but John looks pretty comfortable with it. And he puts it right in the hole that time, so another strike for John Schlitsch as we move on to Faith Roper. And the task at hand has gotten a little easier now. All she's got to do is stay behind the foul line and keep the ball on the lane, and it's good enough. And that's right in the pocket. Faith takes a bow. Noah Hogard, who bowls over at Cherokee Lanes in Canton. That program has really grown since the pandemic and everybody sort of scattered in different directions. While the program at Roswell, a lot of the better bowlers went over to Cherokee. And so their program has benefited from the redistribution of players following the pandemic. So Noah's got a little better competition over there than he might have had had the pandemic not taken place. Throws it pretty straight, just comes straight up the back of it. Doesn't get a lot of drive though. The straight ball is 
not the optimum entry angle. They say straighter is greater, but there is a point of diminishing return. You want to get that ball hooking a little bit. He could use a little axis rotation. And that ball looks like it's slipping off his hand a bit. He might want to get that grip looked at. Anyway, here's Ashley Adams. First frame, she just labeled the pocket. Let's see what she does here. She does it again. So we're going to have to say goodbye to Marquise Burrell, who let one get away from him, sailed off into the moat. So we move on to frame three, go back to the top of the order. And once again, Aubrey Nathanson will lead off. No, oh, look out! Oh, man. Well, and that gives everybody a free run at this. The frame three, all they all have to do is just keep it on the lane and they'll be moving on. But you never know, sometimes people get a little careless. We'll see what happens. Next to play will be Rowan Sautner. Rowan looked like he was just all in on bowling. And then he got into lacrosse and a couple other things and just kind of stopped bowling. And then the pandemic hit. I don't know if he's been out practicing or not, but his game looks like it's in pretty good shape. Three balls, three strikes. And now, Ty Carter once again. Look at this guy. Three balls, three strikes. Doesn't look like he's having any issues with the lanes at all. Well, Christian Manel started with a six count on this left lane the last time he was up over here. And then he ripped them apart in frame two. Let's see what he can do here. Maybe a slight adjustment. Yeah, he caught all of that one. Got him a handful and scatters them. Well, when all you have to do is beat zero, it takes all the pressure off, doesn't it? Alana Harding. She used to bowl out at Stars and Strikes in coming, and then their youth program kind of fizzled and came down here to Roswell. There's seven, that's good enough. And then when our program just basically uh, got suspended due to the coronavirus in 2020, back in March, I guess. Well, everybody stopped bowling. All the bowling centers closed, and you know, this is a story I'm sure you're familiar with, no matter where you are. It happened all across the country. They tried to reopen the bowling centers in the summer of 2020, but very few people came back bowling, and we saw just a few kids start to reemerge in youth programs, and it has slowly built back up. All right, Drake Meenick. Ooh, stone nine. It's okay, nine's enough. Josh Greenberg, who's a good little tennis player. And I would guess that during the pandemic, he probably was able to continue playing tennis. 
That's one of those sports you're not really in close proximity to anyone. Cuts through between the one and six and gets six. Wouldn't be his favorite shot in a match, but in this case, it's enough. Jorge Cepeda, you may recall, was on the winning team of one of our last Thanksgiving episodes. I believe he was partnered with Joseph Ruth that day. And they took home the big bird. He stuffs the pocket that time. So he is safely on to the fourth frame. And now this crafty little lefty. I predict big things for this young man. He's got the right attitude. He's kind of a gunslinger. He's not afraid of anybody. Gets seven that time. Throws a lot of ball for a kid his size. Once he learns to control that thing, and obviously since he recently shot 299, he's learned to control it pretty well. But once he gets a little bigger, gets a little more control, he's going to be dangerous. All right, Jesse Hamadi, who, you know, for as talented as this kid is, he really doesn't bowl in tournaments. Got the game to do it, though. If he ever wanted to. Well, our top four seeds in this event, we haven't told you who they are yet, but the kids who qualified one, two, three, and four, they secured guaranteed spots in the stepladder. We will reveal them once we get through this single ball eliminator. Nolan with seven, that's good enough. Here in frame three. And John Schlitch picks out a ball. With this many people bowling in this single ball eliminator wild card round. There's enough bowling balls for two leagues. This guy practices about as much as any kid we have. Every time I have been at the bowling center during the week on a weekday after school he's up here practicing and he's really gotten a whole lot better so has Faith Roper I think this two-handed style is working for her pretty well I'd like to see her keep her elbow a little closer to her body though But I'll tell you what, she's got enough ball now that she can rip the rack like that. It's a good shot. All right, let's watch Noah. Now, if you pay close attention, you'll see that he actually lays the ball down. It will hit the floor a foot or two short of the foul line. What I'd like to see Noah learn to do is get around the ball a little bit more on the side 
and lift that ball out on the lane where it doesn't touch the floor until it's past the foul line. He comes straight up the back of it, so it's just a straight ball. He'll get a little more action on those pins and make them dance if he learns to get a little axis rotation and a little more fingers in the ball. Comes off his hand a little too quickly. That could be a fit issue. But I know if he's over at Cherokee Lanes, he's got somebody who knows how to drill balls over there, so they can take care of that. Ashley Adams. It breaks high, but gets nine. And that'll do. So we have to say goodbye to Aubrey Nathanson, who put it in the gutter with the first ball in this third frame, while everyone else managed to keep it on the lane. So now three are gone. Who will be next? Rowan hopes it's not him. Nine will usually get you through in one of these. Ty Carter. When I stopped by the league a couple of weeks ago and invited him to this event, he didn't even know what prodigy was. Prodigy heads are going to know who he is if they see him throw enough of those kind of shots. The little guy can roll the rock. All right, Christian Manel. Big loft. Big slap out of the 10 pin. He got every bit of that one. Had to like it. All right. Next up, Alana Harding. Nine is the low number right now. Well, now it's six. That's not what she wanted. Didn't quite catch that one at the bottom. It kind of slipped off her hand, it looked like. This young fella, Drake Meenick, was about as enthusiastic as any of them. He was raring to go when this event started. He had just started coming to Prodigy, just as we had to disband for the pandemic. That's a good ball, just a pinch wide, gets nine. And that'll get him on to frame five. Low pinfall is eliminated. Cuts through the heart, but gets nine. And he gives it a fist pump. He knows that's good enough.
Next to go is Jorge Seda. He and his family from Puerto Rico. And that one sails wide left on him. That's another six count. So now Alana has company. We've got two tied at six. That's not where you want to be. Little double dribble action and there's another six count. So we've got three tied with six. So that's the number everybody wants to beat. If we end up having a tie at the bottom, we'll have a roll off until we eliminate one. And Jesse just gets enough to stay above the fray. He gets seven. Next to go will be Bolin Nolan Kemp. And Nolan rips the rack. There's a strike. So we skip Marquise, who was eliminated in the second frame. And we move to John Schlitsch. John has thrown nothing but strikes so far. And he sends that thing really wide, but he gets it to come back. Strong ball. And now Faith Roper. I joked with Faith when I saw her for the first time. Today I said, oh wait, here's one who hasn't grown in the last 18 months. <laughs> but her game has grown. She's throwing a lot more ball than she used to. And she shreds the rack that time. She will get better and better with that two-handed style. And when she does, look out, ladies. Because she's got a fire in her belly. She's a competitive young lady. All right, Noah. Seven. That'll get you to move on. So we got six as the low number and three people tied at six with Alana, Jorge, and Christopher. Ashley last to go. She just wants to beat six to avoid a roll off or worse. And once again, she plants one knee deep in the pocket. And 
Well, Rowan's ready to start the next frame, but we've got some unfinished business here. We've got a roll off with these three young people, Alana, Jorge, and Christopher. One of them is gonna be eliminated. Alana says, not me. Now remember, you don't have to have the high score. You just need to avoid having the low score. Low pinfall is out. And Jorge smashes the pocket. So Christopher, thrown any pressure shots lately? I guess if you shot 299, you know a thing or two about striking under pressure, but he must strike on this ball or his day is done. How about that? Three balls, three strikes. I love it. So we rinse and repeat and we will continue this until one of these three is eliminated. Ooh, that one sails on her. Six. Well, you never know. But Jorge and Christopher know the number they got to beat. Not a particularly good rack. That seven pin was sitting funny, but he gets seven and that's enough that Jorge will be moving on to the next frame. It's now just a question of, will it be Alana or will it be Christopher who will be watching from the sidelines? Christopher needs seven or better to move on. Six would continue a roll off. Look out. Oh, he brought it back. And nine will get him through. And so that means it's Alana who is eliminated at the end of frame four. And now the plot thickens. We're eliminating two players in this fifth frame. And with that announcement, shock waves are sent through the field as Rowan gets set to go. That's another strike for the young man. You want to see how to generate speed? If you're a little guy, start way at the back of the approach. Take longer steps. That's the best way to generate speed if you need it. Ty Carter next to go. And man, all this guy does is strike. How about that? Again, we are eliminating two players this frame. Boy, as soon as I announced that to the field, everybody kind of sat up straight and was like, okay. Better bring their A ball this frame. Christian gets it a little wide, but gets nine. You would think that nine would be enough. But we'll see. All right, next up is Drake Meenick.
Some of these kids are not used to this kind of pressure. And some of them just, uh, a few of them in this field don't really bowl tournaments of any kind, so this is sort of a different kind of pressure for them. Cuts through the heart, he gets eight. And for the moment, eight is on the bubble. Since we're eliminating two, you just never know what it's gonna take. But Josh Greenberg, who will pace a bit, as he is wont to do. Another guy who starts way at the back of the approach to generate a little extra speed. And there's another eight count. Well, for the time being, at least, eight is trouble. We'll see. Josh, a little unlucky. That five pin was wiggling. It could have gone, but nope. Jorge Seda will just throw a rocket to the pocket here, I'll bet. Well, the Brooklyn pocket anyway. Gets them all to go. So he is safely on to frame six. Christopher Nathanson. That's the kind of ball I am used to seeing him throw. So he's safe. And now Jesse Hamadi. He looked away like he didn't like it, but there was nothing wrong with that ball. Rips the rack and gets a strike. So eight seems to be the number that's trouble at the moment. Remember, we're losing to this frame. And Nolan scatters them, gets them all to go, so he's safe. And next up is John Schlitch, who once again threw a Brooklyn strike in the first frame, and he has been solid in the pocket and has thrown nothing but strikes thus far. With that three-step approach. Go. And he gets another one. So John obviously has this pair wired Meanwhile, Faith is working on three strikes in a row. Oh. 
Oh, she almost fouled. But she stayed behind the line and got them all to go. And next up is Noah Hogard. Once again, the number to beat is eight. Carefully looks down at the approach to set his feet, picks out his target, and goes. Get up. Uh-oh. He knew it as soon as it came off his hand. That's six. And that is the low number right now. And even if Ashley were to match it or throw something less, Noah looks to have eliminated himself with that ball. Ashley wants to beat eight. That would keep her out of a roll off. She plants another one in the pocket to get nine, so Noah is done with six. We've got two at eight. They will go to a roll off, and one of them will be eliminated. That's Drake and Josh, the two that had eight. So yes, we go to a roll off. With Noah already out of the running, one of these two will be eliminated. Who will it be, Drake or Josh? It's nine. So the door is open for Josh. If he can throw a strike here, he'll move on and send Drake home. If he gets nine, the roll off will continue. And if he can't match nine, it'll be Josh who calls it a day. Come on, Josh. You got this, buddy. <laughs> Drake is egging him on. Come on, Josh. You got this. Trying to get in his head, I think. Josh better focus his attention on the task at hand here. Oh, that looked like a good shot when he threw it, but it never took the break. Josh gets seven, and that means it's Drake who's moving on to frame six. All right. Now, before you throw, I'm going to tell you that in this frame, we're going to eliminate three. That's right. We're eliminating three players in frame six. We eliminated two in frame five. This time, three of our little friends are gonna go bye-bye. Rowan is wide right with that toss, but gets a little friendly pin action to get eight. That could prove decisive. All right, next to go is Ty Carter. He's perfect through five frames, thrown nothing but strikes. Pulled that one. Crosses over, gets nine. You would think that might be enough, but when you eliminate three, well, there's no telling. Oh, 
Ooh, gave that one a little extra loft. Sometimes when you loft it, it'll delay the hook, but sometimes when you loft it, it means your fingers will catch it on the upswing and you give it a little extra oomph with your fingers and it'll make it overreact. Sometimes we call that grabbing it. Whatever, Christian got a little too much on that one. It hooks through the nose and he gets seven and now he looks like he could be in trouble. All right, Drake, show us what you got. Things getting a little more tense here as we turn up the heat on these kids. There's nine. You would think that might be good enough. Right now, seven and eight are looking a little dicey. Jorge Seda setting his feet. He's set to go. Well, there's another seven count. And with that, the nine count, Ty Carter and Drake Meenick are now safe. Remember, we're eliminating three players this frame. Low pinfall is out. We've got a couple of sevens and an eight. And Christopher with a strike, he says, count me out of any talk of elimination this frame. Meanwhile, Christian Jorge and Rowan are looking on anxiously. Jesse with a strike says, I'm gonna join you, Christopher, over there in the decompression zone. And not sweat it, this frame. So, Bolin Nolan Kemp, one of our kids who's bowling all masked up. I applaud that. I stayed masked up throughout the day on this occasion. Better safe than sorry. I want you guys to stay safe. There's another seven count. And that means that Rowan is safe now. And we've got three seven counts. Christian, Jorge, and Nolan, all with seven. And now they're just hoping that somebody else joins them so there'll be a roll-off. John has thrown nothing but strikes so far. And he keeps his streak going. That's six in a row. Now Faith Roper. After a six count in the first frame, she's thrown nothing but strikes since. And there's a rope to the pocket. 
10 back. So the number to beat is seven. And now Ashley Adams, who finished fifth in our qualifier, just missing out on a guaranteed spot in the stepladder. That put her into this single ball eliminator wild card round. She needs eight or better to move on. Double dribble, look out. She gets her eight. So looky here, it's Christian, Jorge, and Nolan who are done for the day. We eliminated three this frame. They are the three with the low pinfall, sevens. So our seven counts are done. So we have to say goodbye to them. <laughs> so now, with just eight players left in the field, we're about to eliminate half of them. Here in frame seven, we will eliminate four. We're down to eight players and we're gonna cut the field in half here in the seventh frame. Four players will say goodbye. Six for Rowan. No <laughs> pressure. Yeah. No pressure. Tell you what, this little guy has seemed immune to pressure so far. Pretty cool customer. Pulled another one, but he gets nine out of it. Will nine be enough? Find out. The farther you winnow the field, the less you can be sure that a high number like nine will be enough. One thing's certain, you don't want to be messing around here and getting any low count. Not when you're eliminating four. Well, that one just sailed wide of his mark. He knew it as soon as he let go of it. So six, we've got a couple of those. That doesn't look good. Next to go will be Christopher Nathanson. And oh, by the way, how many littles do we have left in the field? Rowan, Ty. Are we counting Drake as a little? Christopher. So we've got just uh, these four, Rowan, Ty, Drake, and Christopher left in the Littles. The Little who finishes highest in the standings will win our biggest Little award. We don't have any Littles in the top four, I can tell you that much. That's one way to do it. Very impressive. I don't know, was that like a Mahomes no-look pass? Was that a no-look throw by Jesse? I don't know. All right, John Schlitsch 
He's been a striking machine so far today. All this guy does is strike. So let's look at the scoreboard. We've got a pair of sixes that are low and a pair of nines. Remember, we're eliminating four players this frame out of the eight that remain. There's eight. And that puts Faith squarely on the bubble. So the two sixes are low, then the eight. And then if it ended as it is right now, the two nines would be in a roll off for that final spot to remain. So, Ashley, if I were you, I'd be trying to throw a strike here. Because as it stands right now, even nine gets you in a roll-off. Well, she obviously heard me. So, we're gonna say goodbye to the two sixes, Rowan and Drake. The eight is gone, that's Faith. And then our two nines are in a roll off. And that's Ty Carter and Christopher Nathanson. Oh, he gets a crossover strike. Well, this is the second roll-off Christopher has been in so far in this wild card round. The last time he was in a roll-off, he threw a strike on the first roll-off ball. And he needed to to stay in the roll-off. He's in the exact same situation now. Gotta have it. But it goes high, and it's Ty Carter who survives the roll-off. And with the elimination of Drake and Rowan this frame, that means that Ty Carter is our lone surviving little in the field. So Ty is gonna win the biggest little award today. But now we are down to just four. And the rest of the way, we will eliminate just one per frame. And the last one standing will get that five spot in the stepladder. And that's six for Ty, and that could be trouble. Got a little quick with his feet that time. A little out of sync. Didn't quite catch it all with his fingers when he let it go. Jesse got a beat six. Well, I tell you what, he trusted that one out to the right, didn't he? That thing was out on about the third board. But he brought it back, and there's a strike for Jesse. And Ty has just grabbed his bowling ball off the rack, figuring, well, that's it for me. This guy never misses. John's been throwing nothing but strikes today.
Oh, but it hooks high, and he gets five. Unbelievable. One errant shot by John. And he may pay the ultimate price. We'll see. But that just let Ty off the hook. And now Ashley needs to beat five to stay in it. Goes high, gets eight, and that's enough. So it's John Schlitch who goes the whole wild card round throwing nothing but strikes, and then the first time he misses, gets five. And that spells the end of his day. That is a most unfortunate break, but Ty will lead off here in the ninth frame. We're down to just three. Ty, Jesse, and Ashley. One of these three will get the five spot in the stepladder. Uh-oh. Well, he pulled that one way left of his target. Kind of lucky to get eight. At least he caught a piece of the head pin. Or that could have been most anything. But you never know. Eight might go on. Tell you what, you stand here having to wait for these pin setters to cycle. That'll, it's like calling time out on a kicker at the end of a football game. Trying to freeze them. It doesn't freeze Jesse though. There's a strike and he is on to the 10th and final frame of this single ball eliminator wild card round. It's just a matter of who's he gonna bowl? Is it gonna be Jesse and Ty? Or will it be Jesse and Ashley? She's been clutch today. She needs nine or a strike to get to that final frame. We've seen her do it again and again today. She labels the pocket again. And that's the end of Ty's day, but it was a successful outing as he is our highest finishing little in the field and we will have a special award for him at the end of the day. But we are down to our final two in this single ball eliminator wild card round and either Jesse or Ashley will get the five seed in our stepladder finals, you will meet the other four who qualified for the stepladder as soon as we decide this spot. Will it be Jesse or Ashley? Jesse puts in his bid for it. And now Ashley, who has been clutch time after time putting it right in the pocket all day when she needed one she needs one more right here a strike and we would go to a roll off between these two But it sails wide, and it's Jesse Hamadi who claims the fifth spot 
In our Step Ladder Finals, you'll meet all the finalists when we return after this. How does the almond get into Hershey's Kisses with almonds? Little Hershey's Kisses with almonds. Big chocolate taste. Hey everybody, how everybody doing today? Uh, I just want to take a minute to um, acknowledge somebody that's going away. So, um, Coach Randy, you know, bro, you've been you've been a hell of a coach to us up here at this league, man. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you, how much we appreciate you. Uh, especially when Miss Penny left this league and retired, you know this league it kind of got it kind of got to a low point or whatever, and you kind of just took it upon yourself to to just man, you took it upon yourself to get this league back going how it should have been after she left and everything. So man, I just want to say thank you to you and bro, you mean a lot to us, man. You mean a a, a lot to us. All these kids up here. All these kids up here, you mean a, a lot to us, and you mean a lot to our families, and we thank you for everything you did for us, and we gonna miss you. Man, it's crazy that you're moving, but life happens, man, and you just gotta keep it moving, man. You gotta keep it moving. And, man, to all these kids up here that was in this league, man, you taught us a lot about the game, and all the experiences that you had and everything and just when well, you created Prodigy it took this league to a whole nother level because everybody wanted to start coming and bowling with us that then bowl with us before so being that you took that upon yourself to create that show called Prodigy man that <laughs> that elevated the competition man that elevated the competition we had Good people coming up here bowling, man. We had good people coming up here bowling, just a lot of competition and fun, and I'll never forget that. i never forget the first time I did Prodigy. It was crazy, man. It was crazy. But it was a heck of an experience because it taught me a lot about sports shots and how to play and everything, and it was just a cool thing, man. So I appreciate you, and thank you for that also. And, um... Man, it's just crazy that you're leaving, man. Keep on saying that. But it's it's crazy. We love you. We thank you. We going to definitely miss you because you left your imprint out here. And, man, it's hard to say goodbye, but we just thank you for the support. And I thank you personally for all the tournaments and everything that you took me to and the tournaments that you encouraged me to to go to and qualify myself in. So I appreciate you for that. And just everything you did for us, man. We're going to miss you. We hope you can come back to Georgia and visit. But we know when you go back to Kansas City that you're going to take Prodigy Bowlers to it to a whole nother level. It's going to be out this world. We're going to be out this world, and when you're gone, we're going to keep it moving. We're going to keep it moving. We're going to keep it moving. we going to all these kids up here at this league that was up here at this league that is, that's is gone to college now. We all going to make you proud. we all going to make you proud, and it just, we're going to make you proud, man. We're going to make you proud. When you first came here as a coach, we didn't really – we didn't really know you because it wasn't the people that's, that was in this league previously. They wasn't in this league when you first came. So it was me that was here first, Logan Fossum and Christian. We were the first to get the chance to know you. So we know we know about you and you took us under your wings. So, man, from me and Christian and even Logan, man, we appreciate you, bro. We appreciate what you did for us, man. We appreciate everything. You put your heart and soul into this, man. You put your heart and soul into this league, and I appreciate that especially. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate that. Um, 
And it's, it was some rough days up here, but we always got through it. And because of you, I bought my first 300. You know what I'm saying? I bought my first 300. I never thought I would get that. If it wasn't for my pops, if it wasn't for my pops, and if it wasn't for you, Coach Randy, I would have never been able to accomplish that. So I appreciate you, and I thank you for that. Love and respect, Randy Nolan Kemp. Recapping what went down in the single ball elimination wildcard round, Prodigy newcomer Lane Cepeda was first to exit when he missed the head pin and left the super washout in the first frame. Then Marquise Burrell, after starting with a strike, let one sail wide in the second frame and into the moat. That was the end of his day. Aubrey Nathanson met a similar fate in frame three. Then in the fourth frame, three players went to a roll-off and all three threw clutch strikes on their first roll-off ball, but it was Alana Harding who cracked on the next ball to end her day. Then in the fifth frame, I sent shockwaves through the field when I announced we would eliminate two players in this frame. Noah Hogard took one of those off ramps with a six count and two players with eight counts rolled off to see which one of them would get to continue. And it was Drake Meenick who outlasted Josh Greenberg. Then we upped the ante by announcing that three players would be eliminated in frame six and the three players with seven counts, Christian Minnell, Nolan Kemp, and Jorge Seda, all made their exits. In frame seven, the heat got turned all the way up as four players were eliminated in this frame. Six counts by Rowan Sautner and Drake Meenick spelled the end to their day. An eight count by Faith Roper sent her home, and two players with nine counts went to a roll-off to decide who would stay and who would go and it was newcomer Ty Carter who bested Christopher Nathanson to seize that spot to move on. The rest of the way, we eliminated one player per frame till we winnowed the field down to the final player. The next to go was John Schlitch, who had struck on all of his previous balls in the wild card round, but this one shot got away from him, and he only got five, paying the maximum penalty for one errant shot an end to his day. And that left just three. Ty Carter, the lone remaining little in the field, would exit next when his eight count wasn't enough. And in the final frame of the wild card round, the fifth position in our stepladder finals was secured by Jesse Hamadi when Ashley Adams failed to match his strike. So there you have it, the final standings for places six through 21. Now it's time to meet our five finalists in this final stepladder from Atlanta on Prodigy Bowlers Tour. You already know that bowling in the fifth position is Jesse Hamadi, who survived a tough wild card round to have a chance to climb the stepladder and take home the orphaned red coveted trophy pin. He'll face our number four qualifier, making his first appearance on Prodigy Bowlers Tour, Melvin Perry. Melvin bowls at Cherokee Lanes and Bolero Austell, one of two lefties in the field. You're going to love watching this little guy. The winner of that opening match will meet the other left-hander in our field and our number three qualifier, Bryant Griffith. Bryant is a product of the youth program at Bolero Lilburn and has bowled on national television, so he knows what it's like to bowl in front of the camera. The winner of that match will move on to face our number two qualifier and another product of that fabulous youth program at Bolero Lilburn, Jacob Ballinger. When I first laid eyes on Jacob on this day, I didn't even recognize him. He'd grown so much. And his game has matured as well. The pins just make a whole different sound when Jacob's ball hits them. And the winner of that match will bowl for the final Atlanta title on Prodigy Bowlers Tour today in an attempt to claim the orphaned red coveted trophy pin as his own. But to do it, he'll have to get past our tournament leader, Hunter Moffat. Talk about someone who has grown in the last 18 months. This young man is now taller than I am. And while that's a pretty low bar, 
His voice has also dropped almost as low as mine. This is not the same kid who we once referred to as America's favorite nine-year-old. He's grown quite a bit, and whoever meets him for the title better bring his A-game. And that's our final Atlanta field on Prodigy Bowlers Tour. Just a quick recap of the scoring in our qualifying round, as it was Jacob Ballinger who took the early lead after game one, firing a 217. But Hunter was not far behind with a 209. Then in game two, both players held steady, but Hunter just carried a few more strikes and his 224 was enough to edge past Jacob for the lead. But the high game of qualifying came from young Melvin Perry, whose 235 in game two of the qualifying round catapulted him past several players and into that guaranteed spot in the stepladder at number four. Bryant Griffith also fired a strong 229 in game two, despite being in the group that had to move to a different pair of lanes due to chronic breakdowns. And he never felt like he quite got lined up on that new pair. Still, a 229 when you're not lined up is some strong bowling. It took a 200 average to secure a guaranteed spot in the step ladder. As you can see, Melvin Perry's 400 was good for fourth place. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get the stepladder finals underway as our five seed, Jesse Hamadi, takes on four seed, Melvin Perry. And we got to find out who he's bowling for at home. Reach in there and pull out a name. We've got Jack Conrad from Chapman, New Jersey. All right, you heard him. Jack Conrad in Chatham, New Jersey. You're being uh, represented by Melvin and Jesse already drew a name earlier before the wild card round. Remember, one of these kids is gonna go on to win the orphaned red coveted trophy pin today. And the home viewer that he's bowling for will receive the COVID ed trophy pin. Oh, a bad break first turns into a good break. Looked like he was going to have the 7-8 baby split, but broke it up. Just the 8 pin. Melvin Perry the third. We call him MP3. A spare to begin. Next to go is Jesse Hamadi. And of course, he drew a name earlier, as we mentioned, Anthony Tommaso is his home viewer in Nanticote, Pennsylvania. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right or not. A high hit, cuts through, leaves the 3 6 10. Not the best shots to start for either player. We know Jesse likes this pair of lanes. He shot his 299 in league on 39 and 40 and then shot the scoring record on Prodigy here. But that one sails wide and that's an open to begin the match. Well, Jesse's first appearance on Prodigy several years ago was an inauspicious start as the first three balls he threw were in the gutter. He came a long way from there to the 2020 George Washington Open where he threw a lot more balls like that to set the Prodigy scoring record. Breaking a record that had been held by Logan Fossum. Over the third arrow, out to about seven, slaps out the 10. All right, Melvin Perry, the third. 
Look at that. This kid really impressed me today. In the qualifying round and you'll get a good look at him here. Out to about eight at the break point and well, nine in the pit anyway. One stayed on the deck. But they all went back that time. There was some talk about Melvin bowling as a little in this competition today. And somebody said, no, when you see him bowl, you'll know he doesn't bowl like a little. And he sure hasn't. He's bowled great today. Glad he made it on our final Atlanta episode. Little wide with that one. Jesse leaves the two pin. Pretty routine spare. I would expect he would have no problem with this. Just move your feet about Five or six boards to the right, throw it right over your strike target. Oh! Well now, an unforced error there and, well, Jesse's digging himself a hole early. Haven't seen him do that on Prodigy in a while. And that one's just out the window. Man, he sent that one into the weeds. Lucky to get eight. But a pretty simple spare, the one-two. Again, you throw this about like a strike, just maybe nudge your feet a board or two to the right. What? Well, I wouldn't have seen that coming. Complete whiff on the one, two, and that's three opens in four frames for Jesse. And not the start he wanted. But Melvin Perry says, I'll take it. And he takes full advantage. Love the bowling socks. Love the footwork. This kid is going to be dynamite when he gets bigger. He's dynamite now. That is his logo on the back of his shirt. M-A-P-3. And a high hit that time. Gets away with it and leaves just the four. He gave me a face mask with his logo on it. And he throws a straight ball at his spares, but he didn't throw it quite straight enough that time. And after opening up a huge lead, he gives some pins back to Jesse. That tightens the match a bit. But still a pretty big gap, and Jesse is flailing right now. He is lost looking for answers. And that's left. Well, Mama said there'd be days like this, right? He had it going for a while, but now he's either lost his look or just Ain't feeling it. And I think we've all been there. The trick is to try to regroup before it's too late.
All right, the easiest spare to shoot is the five pin. I think every hand in the bowling center would have gone up if he'd missed that one. So he stops the bleeding momentarily. But now he needs strikes, not spares. Heaven knows he's capable of stringing them. And there's one right there. And he gives it a big thumbs up. Take another look. Good balance that time. All right. Melbourne. Ooh. Now, I have to admit, I don't know Melvin's game well enough to know what kind of weight he's throwing, but that is an indication it might be a lighter ball. The 5'10", hit it on the left side of the 5, try to slide that 5 over into the 10. Move your feet about three boards right and throw it over your strike target. Ooh, he gives it a good run. Close, but an open... And that will tighten the match a little bit. Back-to-back -back opens for MP3. And that was a better shot there. Just a pinch high leaves the six. Still a 31-pin lead as we're starting to get late. And he takes care of the single pin spare. Little guy is unafraid. He'll mix it up with anybody. I love that. got to be fierce on the lanes. If you want to win, you just got to know that you will take on any comers. Jesse gets the light shaker to go. Oh, we'll have to take another look at this one. Watch the head pin. The one in front, it's going to go to the left wall. And come back and take out the two, four, five, seven, and eight. <laughs> it's not how, it's how many. That counts the same as one that sends ten back. He can cut the lead to eleven. But he comes up a little thin, and the two won't go. Now he can't afford any more mistakes here. It's getting late in the match. You can't be falling behind by 30 pins with just two frames left. He got just enough of it to knock it down. All right. Melvin, who's been a fan of the show for quite a while, we've seen him comment on some of the videos here on YouTube and in our live streams, but this is his first appearance. And that one got away from him. Missing the head pin. Could have been worse. Could have left a washout or something over there, but leaves the one, three, six. Move your feet. A few boards left. Throw it over your strike target. Look out. Hooks by the head pin. 
And now this huge lead that he had earlier in the match is just about gone. He leads by just eight. Oh, how about that kind of trip six? That's a good trick shot. I got to learn that one. Watch this. Gets the 10 to fall forward into the six. We'll see his reaction to this one. Oh, yes. All right. Oh, he turned away. Oh, I don't know if he turned away because he didn't like it. But it sure found the pocket. That strike by Melvin in the ninth was huge because that means that Jesse can't get up and shut him out. All right. They both strike out. Melvin would win by eight. But Jesse can take the lead for the first time in the match if he can get this first strike in the 10th. This is the shot of the match so far. Oh, and he gets a wall shot to go. And with that, Jesse throws down the gauntlet, takes the lead in the match, and says, Melvin, you're going to have to chase me now. Watch this. The head pin's going to do all the damage. It'll go to the left wall and take out the four, five, and seven. And now, if he can get this next strike... He can force Melvin to have to strike twice in the 10th. Ooh, wrap 10. So the situation is this, with a spare, he would finish at 183. Melvin would need the first strike in the 10th. If Jesse would happen to miss this, we could have a tie. Oh, and he lets it slip by. So that's a 182. So it all comes down to this. Melvin Perry with a strike on the first ball in the 10th and good count will win and advance to match two. If he would happen to spare here in the 10th, he'd need a strike on his fill ball to tie. Oh man, that is not the spare you'd want to have to make. The three, five, six, nine, the left-hander's bucket. Here's how you make it. Put the ball right on the three, five pocket. The three will get the six, the ball will get the nine, he must make it. Man, that's clutch. That is some clutch bowling right there. Watch this one. We'll see his reaction. The emotion's safe. The runner is safe. Well, comes down to one ball. Strike to tie. Anything less, Jesse wins. No! No! He threw it good. But it comes up one pin short. And Jesse steals victory from the jaws of defeat. He was down by 53 pins in this match. And here is the final ball. Oh, the wall shot just wouldn't get the 10. 
So it's Jesse Hamadi who moves on to match two, where he'll face our three seed, Bryant Griffith, next. Look who's driving up on a bowling date. It's Carol Christensen, the AMF bowling girl. Hi, everybody. Come on along and join us, where you see the magic triangle. Sign of AMF automatic pin spotters. It's hard to realize that Carol first went bowling not so many months ago. Look at her now. A strike in the first frame. That wide open bowling area with no distractions is one of the modern features of AMF's famous underlane ball return. It delivers the ball at the rear of the bowling area where it belongs. It's just one of the reasons why so many fans have much more fun at Magic Triangle Centers. Next time you go bowling, won't you join us? Prodigy Bowlers Tour has been an exhilarating ride, a fun ride, an enjoyable ride, but all things come to an end. I'm really happy for the time that Coach Randy has put into the videos. Prodigy Bowlers Tour is the reason why a lot of young kids, such as myself, have started bowling. And this show is a lot more than just bowling. It's, it's about community and our Roswell slash Atlanta community has grown. It started in 2016 with Christian and Logan and has spread out over the few years that it has been going on for. Thank you, Coach Randy, for the years that you've been with us. It has been an honor to say that we, our coach has been the great Coach Randy. Hopefully you will bring all the joy that you have brought to us to Kansas City. Thank you, Coach Randy, for your exhilarating ride. And I'll see you on the other side. Bye. A thrilling finish to a match that, at first, looked like it was going to be a rout in favor of Melvin Perry. But after a few unfortunate missteps in the second half of the match and Jesse stringing together just enough strikes to get himself back in the match, it came down to the very last ball that decided the outcome. Melvin threw a good one, but the pesky 10 pin just wouldn't go. And that puts Jesse Hamadi into match two and gets him one step closer to capturing our final Atlanta title. But first, He'll have to get past one of the best young bowlers in the Atlanta area. Bryant Griffith also knows what Melvin Perry is feeling. In his first appearance on Prodigy, he got off to a 50-pin lead in his match against Charlie Bostic, only to see Charlie climb back in it and snatch victory from the jaws of defeat at the very end. Bryant hasn't appeared on Prodigy all that often, but he's as capable a player as any we've had on the show. If he gets hot, he's about as tough to beat as anyone. Before we get this match started, Bryant needs to draw a viewer name from the drum to determine who he's playing for today. Remember, when we crown a winner of the coveted red trophy pin today, the home viewer that kid is playing for will claim the COVID-ed trophy pin as well from the Pandemic Bowlers Tour. Now, that Pandemic Bowlers Tour Stay at Home House Shot series had three winners, and those three names will be drawn by our top three players. So, let's see who Bryant gets. Uh, Timothy Zavarelli. That's it. Timothy Zavarelli, who was the winner on our very first Stay at Home House Shot series event. Bryant Griffith's bowling for you, buddy. And I should mention that since we had three winners on the Stay at Home House Shot Series on Pandemic Bowlers Tour, those three winners, their names are being drawn by our three, two, and one seeds. So they get no worse than third position in the stepladder. But now it's Jesse Hamadi 
Bryant has decided to let him start the match. Bryant wants to finish first. Ten pin. Well, this house is known for ten pins. The gutters down by the pin deck are at, at maximum allowable depth, so this house has always been kind of known for tens, especially weak tens. Jesse will go straight at it. And covers it. And now our first look today at Bryant Griffith, one of the most naturally gifted young players to come out of this area. In all the time that I've been coaching youth bowling, this kid can really throw it. Gets that one a little wide of his target though. Threw it so hard it had no chance to come back. The washout, the one, three, six, seven. Get it over here in this zone and throw that head pin over into the seven. The ball will get the three and six. Well, he had the right idea, just missed a little right. And he his opponent. I guess we had a little technical glitch there as the platform that holds our camera got nudged, so I suspect the shot is going to be a little off kilter the rest of the way. Oh my goodness. That ball broke sharply after it didn't get up to the head pin in the first frame on the right lane. He gets exactly the opposite reaction this time. It overhooks, goes right through the nose, and he leaves the 4 6 7. And well, good luck with this. Really, the best you can hope for is just to take the two on the left, throw it hard, and hope something bounces out. Any attempt to try to tip the four over into the six, you'll get eight out more often than you make it. That's the smart play. He just didn't get anything to bounce out. But that's back-to-back -back opens to start and not what we expect from Bryant Griffith. But I'm sure he'll show us something before this is over. He always does. But Jesse with an early gift. And I don't think he's bold, these players from Lilburn like Bryant Griffith and Jacob Ballinger before, so he may not know what a gift this is that he just received. But he takes full advantage of it. Puts a strike on the board. And he's off and running. Can't throw it any better than that. Well, Jesse may not be that intimidated by these foreigners coming into his house. He knows this pair of lanes about as well as anyone, including the adults who bowl here. There's another one. Tell you what, you let Jesse get started striking and he may not stop. I don't think he loved that one when it came off his hand, but he loves it now. All right, Bryant, it's go time.
Well, a slight adjustment from the ball he threw in the first frame, but it still doesn't quite get up to where he wants it. Usually lane 40 hooks a little more than 39, but Bryant is finding the opposite to be true. Oh my goodness. He's just not getting the ball reaction he's expecting. And so there's three open frames to start and I can promise you that is not what we expected to see from this young man. Although I have to say in all honesty I've seen him go hot and cold at times. But boy, when he's hot, he's as tough to beat as anyone. He will throw a lot of those. I love this free arm swing, man. That's just as good as it gets. That's the kind of swing that'll hold up under pressure. Jesse doesn't intend to put himself in a position where He's under pressure this game. That's a 54 pin lead. That'll take the pressure off. Swings this one out to about 10 or 11. Well, we've seen him strike swinging it out to about three or four. He swings it out to about 10 or 11 at strikes. Well, you give a player seven boards that they can hit. And I think I could strike if you gave me seven boards to hit. Maybe. Not sure I could stand up, but... Well, there's that pesky 10 pin again. Part of the game. If you're a right-hander, you better know how to shoot 10 pins. Takes that white spare ball and covers it easily. All right. Bryant's got his work cut out for him, but I'll tell you what, we've seen some big leads dissipate on this show over the years. We just saw one dissipate in the last match. Bryant's going to try to duplicate the feet here. But once again, he can't get the ball up to the head pin on the right lane. Just got to straighten up the angles. Here's the one, three, nine. This is how you make it. Put the ball just on the right side of the head pin. And you do it right. You'll touch all three pins with the ball. Just like that. That was well done, but Bryant needs strikes, not spares. If he wants to climb back into this match. He's certainly capable. Biggest challenge with Bryant is he's got to keep his head in the match. If he does, he'll be there at the end. He can make those pins dance, I promise you. This is one of his better shots of the match so far. Straighten up the angles a little bit. Hit him thin. Gets the wall shot. Now he needs to string a few on top of that one.
put a little pressure on Jesse, who's cruising along with a 53-pin cushion. Oh, look out. Oh, that was left of left. I don't know if he was trying to find out if he had seven more boards to the left that he could use, but such was not the case. The 510, a split you don't see a right-hander leave very often. But here's how you make it. Slide the 5 over into the 10. I'm sure he'll give it a good try. But that's an open frame and exactly the kind of thing that Bryant Griffith needs to see a little more of. He needs Jesse to give him a little help. Jesse needs to just put that behind him and get back up on the horse and ride. He is really taking his time today. Well, we've seen a few of those. He threw that one out the window. When I used to play golf, I would occasionally hit one way off line and I'd say, I hit that one where the elephants go to die. About like that shot Jesse just threw. But the one, two, pretty easy spare. We saw him whiff this earlier though. Not this time. So now Bryant, with a strike working, can make this a match if he can throw a couple of strikes here. Strike here would cut it to 30. Another strike in the eighth would cut it to 20. And then it would be game on. Oh, you're kidding. Well... Gotta wonder if that was a bad rack. Bryant Griffith throws way too much ball to be leaving a 7-9. Holy mackerel. Well, that's about as bad a break as you could ever hope for. Again, not much you can do with this. Just hit one of them hard and hope it bounces out. Well, we almost did. But, it's an open frame. And the lead stands at 52 as we are getting late. Bryant can strike out for 184. Jesse is going at a 206 pace. Well, Bryant needs four more of those and to hope that a train runs over Jesse. He's figured out the left lane. He needs to unlock the mystery of lane 40. Fortunately, he will finish on lane 39, but Jesse has this match in hand if he just doesn't steer it off the tracks. Solid strike. Watch it again. This is going to be 
Just dead solid perfect. That's another one that only got out to about 11. Going a little straighter with him now. Now here's the deal. If he goes open, open in the ninth and 10th, he's gonna be in the 180s. Bryant can strike out for 184. So with any kind of a mark and good count, Jesse can just about walk it home. Well, he'll leave himself a little challenge here. The two, four, five, eight, the bucket. We saw Melvin with this in a critical situation in the last match. The left-hander's bucket, the three, five, six, nine. See what Jesse can do with the two, four, five, eight. Can't say that he needs it with a 52 pin lead, but he'd sure like to make it. And he gets it, and that's going to make things very difficult for Bryant, even if he strikes out. Because that gives Jesse 176 if he throws the next two balls in the gutter. Bryant can finish with 184 with four strikes here. That's what he's been looking for on the right lane. And he's got to be asking himself, where was that earlier? Well thrown. That's what I figured he was going to give us all game. Yep. Somehow the strikes come easier when it doesn't matter anymore. At least that's been my experience. He puts such a nice roll on the ball. I love this guy's game. He reminds me a little bit of Dave Davis, PBA Hall of Fame left-hander. Not as tall as Dave, but lanky, free swing. Look at that. The pins just want to get out of the way. Watch it again. I have never seen Bryant out of balance at the line. He always finishes in perfect balance. Nice steady head through release. All the things you look for in a quality player. He's got it all going on. He just, every once in a while, just kind of has a little mental lapse and something gets in his way. I'd like to have his game. That's a 184 and it may not be enough. Jesse just needs a few pins here and he will be advancing to match three. Five pins on the first ball, and he will be moving on. And there it is. Doesn't matter if he makes this or not, he has already won the match. But Bryant finished strong with six of the last seven possible strikes and a five-bagger to close. Just dug himself a hole at the beginning. 
open, open, open to start, and then that 7-9 in the seventh frame was just a killer. He had just struck in the sixth. Put a strike up there in the seventh frame where that 7-9 stood, and he finishes in the two teens, and he wins this match despite the rough start. But it's Jesse Hamadi who will face the player with the most devastating strike ball in our field today, Jacob Ballinger. Match three is coming up right after this. In the afternoon, when things slow down, when you're wondering what to do, Let's go! Go bowling! Nothing brings people together or makes friends so fast as bowling. So call a friend. Bowl Brunswick tomorrow. Um, I just wanted to say, you know, when, when Randy called and, and told me he was going to do one last event here in Georgia, I myself was pretty happy. Um, we hate that he's going, but um, just hope he, he would do at least one last goodbye event just so you know we can say goodbye and all that and and i know when he's out in kansas city i'm sure there's going to be a bunch of youth bowlers out there that's going to put on a show for him and right after this pandemic is over of course but um no it's 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 really crazy to me what prodigy blossomed to be um we started back in the fall of 2016 with just little little action matches and we were doing that months prior um me logan charlie brandon for example just do a little qualifier and seat ourselves in the top four just just having fun with it and one day randy decided to pull out a camera and now we got almost 19,000 subscribers on the channel that's insane and to you to you guys watching at home thank you guys so much for all all the comments you gave and and all the tournaments that, that us kids would go to like the amount of people that just knew us just from just from youtube that's it's insane to me um but but yeah i just wanted to come on here and say that but i hope you guys have a wonderful day maybe i might be holding that red trophy pin <laughs> but um yeah, I guess this is Christian saying bye. <laughs>well bryant griffith finally got it going at the end of the match closing with a five bagger and six of the last seven strikes but unfortunately he just dug himself too deep of a hole early on and ran out of frames to close the gap at the end so it's jesse hamadi who continues to climb the step ladder as in this format you keep advancing as long as you keep winning but now he's up against jacob ballinger who has had the look of a winner all day long. I've never seen Jacob appear so confident as he has on this day, and I suspect Jesse's gonna have his hands full this game. But first things first, we gotta get Jacob to draw a viewer's name from the drum to see who he'll be playing for for the COVID-Ed trophy pin. Calling for Michael B. Ong. This is Michael T. Wong of uh, Worcester, Massachusetts. And as I mentioned earlier, our top three seeds in the stepladder, drawing from the three names who were designated as winners on the 
post-pandemic Bowlers Tour stay-at-home house shot series. Michael T. Wong being one of them. Jacob Ballinger bowling for him. Did I mention something about his devastating strike ball? Uh, yeah. Take another look at it. This two-hander puts his thumb in the ball. All the way. And those pins go and run and hide. Jesse bowling for Anthony Tommaso. Comes up a little thin and leaves a tricky little spare, the 4-8. We don't see this all that often. It's like the 2-5, but because it's all the way over on the left side of the lane, it's very easy to chop. You got to be really careful with this. I like to see a player shoot this down the left side of the lane to cut down the angle of chopping it. Oh, you heard him stomp the floor. I think he thought that he had chopped it, but he gets away with it. Both players with a mark to start this match. Jacob has been over to Bowl Prodigy Bowlers Tour with us on a few occasions, and it seems like every time he's been over to bowl with us, he finishes third. He will need to get past this match today to snap that string. And Jesse wants to make that as difficult for him as possible, but he leaves the 2-8. Got to hit this one pretty flush on the front pin. Or if you're throwing a right-to-left hook, you can hit it on the right side, but got to be careful not to slip over to the left side of the front pin or you'll leave that sleeper 8 in back. That's how it's done, right there. Now Jacob working on a strike can increase his lead. Whoa! Well, that's about the only way you're going to stop a player like Jacob Ballinger is just have him have bad carry because he's going to be there and he's going to throw plenty of ball every time oh, but then when he makes mistakes like that he'll give you an opening well Because he puts his thumb in the ball when he bowls two-handed, he doesn't need a separate ball to throw one-handed. He puts his thumb in it and goes straight at that spare, but he just pulled it. So, Jesse with the early lead. And the 10 pin, once again, this time a weak 10, and it's almost inconceivable that Jacob could leave a weak 10. He throws so much ball, but you just saw it. And now he's gone to get a different ball to shoot at this spare. He missed the 10 pin going one-handed. I think he's gonna shoot two-handed at this with a spare ball, it goes straighter. Yep. Well, makes amends for the missed 10 in the second frame. 
And he has that look on his face that he is very determined. Jacob is a funny cat. He is so competitive. He does not like to lose. And believe me, I can relate. I don't think Jesse liked that one when it left his hand, but he got away with it. We've talked about the area that he has. We've seen him strike when he swings it out to about 10 or 11. Watch how far to the right this one goes. That's out to about four and catches the light shaker. So he's definitely got some area. That'll make him hard to beat. Oh, he pulled it. And he still ripped the rack. <laughs> oh, my goodness. He missed way to the left with that one and just sent that five pin whistling right over into the seven. A swisher strike. All right, Jacob. Let's see how mad he is with this ball. <laughs> Look out. There's shrapnel flying everywhere. He puts a nice roll on this one. He doesn't overpower it. He just rolls the ball. But he gets a handful every time. Watch this. Those pins just have no chance. He just lays that thing down at the line and just rolls it. <laughs> Timber! Watch his footwork. Five-step approach. Little crossover with the second step. Little hop like you see the two-handers. Swings it out to about five. Half pocket. Messenger. See you later, pins. Jesse's going to have his hands full before this match is over. You watch. Oh boy, he's been flirting with that right edge for a while. This time, he just got it a little too wide. The two, four, eight, ten. This can be made. You gotta hook the ball to the two and four. You can actually get that four to take out the eight if you hook it enough. Oh, how about that? What a shot. Watch this. Look where this ball is at about the 40-foot mark. It's hanging over the edge. We'll see his reaction to it. <laughs> well, I tell you what, he needed it too. That keeps him in the match. In fact, he maintains the lead with that spare. He would have surrendered the lead had he opened. But then he comes right back with a pretty good ball and leaves the ring 10. And he sure didn't get that one out to the edge. That was one of those that found just how far to the left he could miss. He'll go straight at it. Oh, he lets that one sail by. And there's the opening that Jacob was waiting for. So the lead changes hands. 
And now Jacob working on a double with a chance to put some distance between himself and Jesse. <laughs> wow. What a ball. Man, if you'd have been sitting any closer, you might have got sucked in by the backdraft. Watch this. These pins will just explode when the ball gets there. They couldn't get out of the way fast enough. Well, I believe he has gotten lined up. And now Jesse better bring it the rest of the way. Tell you what, the thing about Jacob's game that I'm so impressed with is he's gotten a lot taller and yet he's gotten better about keeping his head steady and his eyes on his target. He didn't used to do that all that well. But he does now. And Jesse gets the nine pin to go late. And now he will try to put up a few strikes here at the end and make this a match. Tell you what, this guy will not go quietly. He may not be as tournament tested as players like Jacob and Bryant and some of these other kids, but Jesse definitely has a desire to win. And he's got that little shimmy too. What was that? Oh, look out. Another one of those air balls. Yeah, he said, I pulled it so far. Yes, he did. He, that wasn't Brooklyn. That was all the way to Buffalo. And now with Jacob lined up and stringing strikes, Jesse cannot afford any more errant shots the rest of the way. All right, routine spare, no problem. Now it's just a matter of, is Jacob gonna give him a chance? Well, maybe. That one just got a little wide of his target, so it hit the dry. Remember, we're bowling on the house shot. A 6, 9, 10. Put the ball on the 6 and 10. You'll make it every time. You get it a little wide on the house shot, it'll hit the dry early, and it'll start hooking early. That's what happened to Jacob's ball there. Found the nose. Lucky to leave just these three. But he covers it without a problem and maintains a 23 pin lead going into the ninth and 10th. Jesse with a possible 212. Jacob going at a 215 pace. So it's anybody's match. See you later. Just sent half the rack over at the seven pin. Really solid game. He's just gotten better and better as he's grown up.
always in contention at the big tournaments in this area. I mentioned that Bryant Griffith had national television experience. So does Jacob. So he knows all about bowling under pressure. All right, Jesse, it's time to go off the sheet. Well, there's the first one. Can't get four in a row if you don't get the first one. Gets that one out to about six. And that looks like that's the sweet spot on lane 40 for him. But he is going to need to get all three in the 10th to give himself much of a chance. There's the next one. So that cuts the lead to 13. And that one got out to about six, like the one on lane 40 a moment earlier. But this is the critical shot right here. A strike here, and he will at least force Jacob to mark in the 10th. It's going to be very difficult for Jesse to win this match if he doesn't strike on this ball. But he gets the shaker to go. And here's the situation. With a strike, Jesse shoots 212. That will definitely force Jacob to get a mark in the 10th, and he will need to fill 18 to win. A strike here for 212. Jacob would need a spare and eight for 213. This is an important shot here. Get all you can. No, oh, he short counts. That's not good. Seven will give him 209. Jacob still needs to mark but that makes his job a little easier on the second ball. A spare here and decent count. A spare and then five is all he needs. A strike here and it's Lock City. Oh, man. He's got all the shots. A light hit. And he trips the two from the wall. Watch this. Watch the head pin. It goes so fast to the wall, it comes back before the ball hits the back of the pit. He really gets those pins to dance. And now he just needs to stay behind the foul line. And there's your winner. Wow. Those pins are just on fire man watch the five pin <laughs> this thing is gonna whistle over into the seven and just chop its legs out from under it one more for 235 which would tie the high game of the day in this event there you go 235 and it's Jacob Ballinger who will face Hunter Moffat for our final Atlanta title on Prodigy Bowlers Tour, right after this. These days, popular teenagers all over the country are finding fun and good companionship in America's most wholesome game. It's the new rock and roll. Roll means bowl. All the fellas and gals are out bowling. Rock and rolling means bowling. Bowling means Brunswick. 
every guy and gal should know the name. Brunswick! So join the kids and start in bowling. It's the newest rock and rolling. America's swinging this teenage game. And Brunswick is the name that makes the game. America swinging this teenage game. And Brunswick is the name that makes the game. Hi, Prodigy Bowler fans and Coach Randy. This is Emily Reddick coming to you from my lovely apartment at Louisiana Tech University. I heard Coach Randy was doing his last event in Atlanta and wanted to make this little video to surprise him. Thank you, Coach Randy, for creating Prodigy Bowler Sewer as I wouldn't have my memories from when I was able to compete there. One of my favorites was when the lights went out in Jefferson in the Back to the Future episode. Who would have thought it would have taken that long to get the lights turned back on? To all the Prodigy Bowlers bowling today, good luck and enjoy the experience. It's something I've always enjoyed, and I wish I could be there with you guys. However, we have our tournament in Tulane this weekend. Uh, to Coach Randy, good luck with your move, and I hope you are able to find a new home for Prodigy in Kansas City. We'll miss you. You gotta admire Jesse's determination. Despite being way behind in the match, he did what he had to do to force Jacob to show up in the 10th and mark. But then Jacob did what winners do. He performed when he needed to. So it's a third place finish for Jesse Hamadi in this final Atlanta-based Prodigy Bowlers Tour event. And it comes down to the one and two seeds for the title. One of these two will win the orphaned red coveted trophy pin. Jacob will be looking to become the second player from Bolero Lilburn in four years to win the coveted trophy pin, Peyton Smith being the first. And Hunter, who was left winless in the 2019-2020 season and never got to sign this red pin, has his second chance to win the coveted trophy pin after he was in the championship match at the Prodigy TOC in 2019, only to come up short. Jacob rolls as hard-hitting a ball as any of the kids in Georgia, and he's an age division or two ahead of Hunter, so Jacob has a decided advantage. But he better not take Hunter lightly. Ever since Hunter's first appearance on Prodigy Bowlers Tour in 2017, He's proven that no matter who the competition and no matter how long the odds are for him to win, he is afraid of no one and will mix it up with the best of them. This should be a very interesting clash. Let's get Hunter to reach into the drum and see who he's playing for in the competition for the COVID-ed trophy pin. So there's not much mystery here. The top three seeds all got to... Uh draw from among the three people who's, who won on Pandemic Bowlers Tour, and yours is... Austin Hill from Union City, Indiana. Austin Hill from Union City, Indiana. Hunter is bowling for you. Good luck. Well, as I mentioned earlier, one of these kids is going to walk away with the red orphaned coveted trophy pin. And whoever their home viewer is that they drew, that person will receive the COVID-ed trophy pin that we bowled for on the Pandemic Bowlers Tour Stay-at-Home House Shot Series. Well, hello. Did I mention that Hunter recently bowled a 300? He'd been knocking on the door for a while and finally got it. And he needs 11 more of those to do it here on Prodigy today. But he's going to have to get past a tough customer. Oh, man. And Jacob has really got it going today. Hunter is going to have his hands full trying to get past Jacob Ballinger. But I tell you what, both of these guys have grown so much in the last 18 months since I last saw them. I didn't recognize Jacob at all 
And Hunter is taller than I am, which I know is a pretty low bar, but still. Well, Jacob is just putting on a clinic. Take another look at his footwork. It's a thing of beauty, and man, he catches a handful every time. But Hunter's not gonna lay down. Tell you, the thing about Hunter is, you might think he's just a little kid that's grown up a little bit, but there aren't many kids I know who are more single-minded in their focus and who want it any more than this guy does. And if desire means anything, tell you what, Hunter's got it in spades. Any questions? Three straight balls, three straight strikes by Hunter. Every one of them solid in the hole. Well, the action has really heated up. We're down to the two players who really outclassed everybody throughout this event. It's fitting that it comes down to these two. Ooh. That was just a pinch high, and he almost paid a big price for it. But he trips out the nine, leaves just the four. An easy spare. Jacob likes to hook at these, so he'll send it down the right side of the lane and just bend it in. Like that. I am digging the Bugs Bunny bowling shirt. Have I mentioned that? That's awesome. I may have to get me one of those. Oh, what was this? Well, he is not happy, obviously. He's not grabbing at his ankle. I don't think he hit his ankle. Sounded like his shoes were screeching on the floor. I don't know if he's stuck. I have no idea what happened there. Ugh, disaster. Six out. After he loses ten pins in count on the first ball. And now Hunter with a 35 pin lead. Working on three in a row. And he just shakes him up. Takes full advantage and increases his lead to 45. This kid has really grown up on Prodigy, hasn't he? Well, that one hooked high, and now he's got the 6, 9, 10. We saw Jacob shoot at this, and he had no problem with it. We've seen some big leads evaporate when spares like this were missed. Hunter better be careful. Now that's not what he wanted. And you don't want to be giving Jacob Ballinger reprieves. This guy can string them like nobody's business. But I think right now Jacob is just trying to mentally refocus and try to shake off what happened in the fourth frame like it was a bad dream.
and the ball doesn't quite get up. Two, four, five. Well, he had it going for a while, but now a nine count and then that disaster in the fourth frame. He just got to forget all about that. Covers the spare. And now we're halfway through the championship match. And Jacob in an unfamiliar position, having to chase from behind. He goes a little straighter that time, doesn't swing it out as wide, and it just set in the oil and never made the turn. And this time he's got a little more difficulty with the sleeper in the back, the 2458. But he makes short work of it. And now Hunter will try to start another little string of strikes. Stuffs them straight back. Straighter is greater. He went a little straighter with that one. That's wide. Almost got it back, but leaves the eight. I remember when this kid first came to bowl at what at that time was called Brunswick Zone Roswell. And I saw him and his dad. And I tried to convince him, I think this kid wants to bowl, dad. But they had commitments to Taekwondo or something. And we didn't see him for several months. And then one day, about halfway through the season, he joined our league. And a couple of weeks later, he was on Prodigy for the first time. And, well, you've seen him grow up since then. Well, Jacob is confused now. He's just lost his look. Whatever it was he was doing before, he's just can't find it now and he's left the one two four eight there's a myriad of ways you can miss this but the best way to shoot it is to put that ball right on the one two oh but he catches too much of the one pin sends the two around the four and that's trouble Hunter's lead grows to 47 pins with just three frames left. Jacob can strike out for 196. Hunter going at a 213 pace. Jacob's got to just go sheet here. And he loses his carry. Unbelievable. Well, stranger things have happened, but he's just got to make this and strike out and hope that lightning strikes or something. No, oh, that's not going to get it done. Well, that's a shame. Jacob bowled so well closing out that last match and he got off to a fast start here. Just 
Just a skosh high with that one. Do the math here. Jacob can strike out for 175. Hunter with a spare here will likely... Oh, but don't hurt him now. With that spare, he can just about shut the door with his first ball in the ninth frame and then take a victory lap. Not the finish I predicted. There you go. Hunter's your winner. And he does it easily. Wow. And now it all comes back to Jacob. As if on cue. As I said before, it's amazing how the pins seem to know when the stakes have been reduced to nothing. They go so much easier then. He's just going through the motions now. Not the finish he wanted, obviously, but he didn't finish third again. And I would say there's always next time, but he'll have to come to Kansas City for a next time. And he is, of course, welcome wherever Prodigy lands. I don't know where that's going to be. As I do the play-by-play -play of this, I've actually already moved to Kansas City. He'll just finish this one-handed. And I don't know where Prodigy will find a home up here in KC, but I hope to find a place where the show can call home. That search will begin sometime after the first of the year. And Hunter gets to take a victory lap. And isn't it ironic that Hunter never got to sign this red coveted trophy pin. We had it made for the 2019-2020 season and he never won that year so he never got to sign it. But he's going to get to take it home with him today. And now consider the fact that the first coveted trophy pin that we gave away at the end of the 2016-17 season, that one was won by Charlie Bostic, and Charlie gave it to Hunter. So now Hunter's going to have the first coveted trophy pin and the last one in Atlanta. So he's going to have coveted trophy pins as bookends. That is a 232 for a big win for the final winner in Atlanta on Prodigy Bowlers Tour. So I just, we were just talking earlier that you never did sign that pin because you didn't win in. 2019 2020 so wouldn't it be ironic if you ended up winning the thing and would you just tell me I made the ironic happen yes you did congratulations Thank you. the final winner of prodigy bowlers tour in the Atlanta area what a send-off way to go Still got a little more business to tend to, a couple of more awards to hand out, and we'll do that next. The perfect Christmas gift for the bowler on your list is inside this envelope. 
It's a Brunswick Bowler's gift certificate. And with it, a bowler can get a high-scoring Brunswick ball, bag, and bowling shoes. So why not stop in at your favorite bowling lane, sports, jewelry, or department store and pick up a Brunswick Bowler's gift certificate? Yes, this Christmas, why not give all three the easy Brunswick gift certificate way? And that's the way to take care of your Christmas shopping. Randy, you are so much more than a bowling coach. You have enriched our lives, and we will never forget you. I hope the families in Kansas City recognize how lucky they are to have you moving into their backyard. Good luck on the move, happy trails, and thanks for the memories. So with that, our five-year run of Prodigy Bowlers Tour in suburban Atlanta comes to a close. A triumphant close for one Hunter Moffat, who brought his best to the lanes on this day and claimed as his own the orphaned, red, coveted trophy pin. But there are a couple of other bits of business to handle. By winning the coveted trophy pin, Hunter also won for his home viewer, Austin Hill of Union City, Indiana, the COVID-Ed trophy pin, that giant pin that I signed for each home viewer after I bowled for them and won on the short-lived Pandemic Bowlers Tour stay-at-home house shot series from my living room when the quarantine first began. Austin Hill, I will tell you that the pin is currently in storage with all the rest of my belongings. But as soon as I get to move into my permanent residence in suburban Kansas City in mid-January, shipping that thing off to you will be at the top of my to-do list. And you know, I had a couple more of those giant pins, which double as piggy banks. I had the kids who bowled in the event today sign both of them. I kept one as a going away souvenir, and the other was set aside as the prize for our highest finishing little in the field today. And that honor went to 12-year-old Ty Carter, who outlasted the other littles in our single ball elimination wildcard round. It came down to a roll-off between him and Christopher Nathanson for this honor, and Ty took home the award as Biggest Little. This young man is new to the Roswell Varsity League, and they're lucky to have him. This guy finished higher than all the other littles in the field, and so he gets the first, the first Little Award. Way to go. Well, since this episode was recorded, Oreo and I moved to the greater Kansas City area. And in the coming weeks and months, I hope to scope out the youth bowling scene here in the area in hopes of finding a new place to coach and a new home for Prodigy Bowlers Tour. And if I find one, I know that those of you in Prodigy Land will embrace a new cast of characters. But I gotta be honest, the kids that I've had the privilege of being around these past eight years as a coach and these past five years with Prodigy Bowlers Tour will always be special to me. From the very first episode between Logan Fossum and Charlie Bostick to our very last episode with Hunter Moffat putting an exclamation point on these five years, producing the show has been the most fun I've had around the sport of bowling. And I hope I can find a place to relaunch the show in Kansas City. Call it Prodigy 2.0 sometime in the near future. But these Atlanta kids are my babies. I love them all dearly, and I will miss them. But that's what email and phones are for, right? Hunter was our first kid to show up to bowl in the new Prodigy wear. Even his dad came to the bowling alley wearing one of the new Prodigy t-shirts. Anyway, for now, this is Coach Randy speaking to you from Kansas City, Missouri my hometown, home of the world's greatest barbecue, and my favorite football team. Wishing you and yours good bowling and the happiest of holiday seasons. I'll talk to you again in 2022.
driving down Lee Boulevard, northbound in Leewood, Kansas. This is not too far from the house I lived in as a little boy from first grade through seventh grade. And I'm just kind of retracing some of my steps. One of the first things I wanted to see once I was in my car and had the mobility that you don't really have when you're driving a 15-foot U-Haul truck hauling a trailer with a car on it, was to um, go look at that house that I lived in. And the most amazing thing happened. The gentleman who lives there was out mowing the lawn, which was my job from about 1961 to 1965, once I was old enough to be trusted on the riding lawnmower. And uh, I got to talking to the guy. I slowed down and he got off the tractor and came over and visited with me and I told him that I grew up in that house and he was talking about how one of his neighbors who died a couple of years ago, who I knew quite well, had given him some of the backstory about the house. And, you know, I was able to fill in a few blanks for him. And I asked him if he would be willing to let me come in and walk through the place. And, you know, I told him, you know, if you're not comfortable with it, I understand. But he let me come in and I got a tour of the place. It was amazing. Some of the things are pretty similar. Much of it has changed through the years. We moved out of that house in 1965. I expected it to be totally different. And, you know, some of it was quite different. Some walls had been knocked down and new things had been added. And, you know, that's normal. But they, they really improved it. I mean, it's much nicer than it was when we were there. But then he took me downstairs to the basement. My dad had finished out the basement. And the bar that he built was still there. The same countertop that it had when, when we were there. And I went into the little room that was my playroom as a kid. Where I had my little bowling alley on the concrete floor. About the only part of the basement that wasn't finished out. And part of it was the concrete floor was still exposed. And the most amazing thing happened. I looked down on the floor and the little magic marker circles, dots that I had painted to set the bowling pins on were faded but still visible. Ghosts from the past, man. Anyway, the guy was super nice. I understand that he probably had some misgivings about allowing a stranger into his home. I'd feel the same way. but. He was very cordial, very nice, and uh, it really couldn't have been nicer. And I'm just thrilled to have had the opportunity to walk through that place. Just unbelievable. Totally made the trip worth it. Anyway, that's it for now. We have driven through Lee Boulevard, and we're about to cross over into Missouri. And we're heading down to the Airbnb to check in. So... We are just about moved in. Talk to you later.